Good evening, everyone, and uh, happy Sabbath. Um, what we're, uh, we're going to do, of course, we're going to read A.T. Jones' uh, Third Angel's Message, Sermon Number 16. Uh, but before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the Sabbath hours. For the blessings of this past week and um, for the blessings of this message. We're thankful for your work of Holy, the Holy Spirit upon the hearts of those around us. And we're thankful for the people that you brought into our lives um, that are receptive to truth. And we ask, Lord, that we can be living examples of Christ and of your word. We ask that as we continue to read through A.T. Jones this evening, that your Holy Spirit can speak to our hearts in a powerful way, and that you can use us to share these truths to others. We pray for this movement, for the studies tomorrow, and, um, and we just ask, Lord, that um, our fellowship with each other will bring us closer to Christ and um and to each other as well. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, happy Sabbath again. So this, um, I usually like to give a little bit of a summary or review, I guess, of what we've been reading. And and, and Jones is going to talk about this. And we read a little bit of this at the close uh, of the meeting last Friday just dealing with the idea of the latter rain. And, and of course, uh, Brother Starr is going to say, you know, that Ellen White has said that we've been in the time of the latter rain since the Minneapolis meeting. And, and Adventists have talked about that, you know, that the third angel's message was the beginning of a loud cry or the latter rain. And, and yet, you know, when we talk about it, when this movement has talked about, you know, 9-11, was the time, you know, the latter rain began to be sprinkled. What, what kind of reaction would we get from conservative Adventists? A lot of it would be a rejection. Yeah, and, and it seems kind of odd that they, they believe that the latter rain had begun to fall in 1888, but yet they couldn't conceive that it's, it's falling in our time. Now, of course, part of it is their lack of understanding what the latter rain is. And so what is the latter rain? Is it some magical thing that happens where we're just standing there one day and all of a sudden this latter rain sprinkles down on us and we're filled depends with the upon Holy Spirit? Depends upon us. What's that? Depends upon us. Okay, but 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 we know that the latter ring is is something that is a message, right? Agreed. Yes. Yeah. So it's a message, and that means that it's it's something that needs to be studied and understood. It needs to be received. And so, you know, in talking about this latter ring. I mean, I remember the upper room studies back in the mid 80s where we were, you know, praying for the latter rain to be poured out. But, you know, often people are are praying for the latter rain. But when the latter rain began to fall, many people denied it. That is, you know, people who were in the upper room studies with me back in the mid 80s um, who had been praying for the latter rain. When we started to receive this light they didn't believe that it was from God. And yet that's what we prayed for. Um, you know, similar to this, it was interesting. This would be about two years ago or so. Uh, one of the guys from my church was doing the sermon. And he was talking about how God is going to uh, give us a message. And, and he may even have someone in our midst uh, who's going to have this message uh, that we need to hear, right? 
that we're going to, we, we're going to have a message and, and it could be people that, you know, are in our congregation who are going to have a message that we need to hear. But he had rejected anything that I had to say, you know, so he was, it's like, you know, the Jews, when they're waiting for Christ to come, but when Christ comes, they don't recognize him. Not, I'm not trying to compare myself with Christ. I'm just trying to say there's a message, right? There's a message that needs to be heard. And we pray for this message. We want this message. But yet we don't recognize the message. And, and this is what was happening in 1888. Um, Ellen White makes clear parallels to the 1888 message and the rejection of Christ, correct? Yeah. Uh, I didn't get for it. Who's talking? Well, they don't recognize the light. Yeah, they don't recognize it as light. Okay, so anyway, let's read here. It says, <clears throat> Joan says, I received a letter a little while ago from Brother Starr in Australia. And I will read two or three sentences because they come in well just at this place in our lessons. Sister White says that we have been in the time of the latter rain since the Minneapolis meeting. And that is just what we found in our own study of these lessons, is it not? Brethren, how much longer is the Lord going to wait before we receive it? He has been trying these four years to have us receive the latter rain. How much longer is he going to wait before we receive it? Now, this subject will join right on to Brother Prescott's, and his talk is simply the beginning of mine. And what he called upon everyone here to do is what everyone should have done four years ago. And the fact of the matter is something is going to be done. Those who will seek the Lord that way, who will receive his message that way, will get what he wants to give. And those who will not do that will be left to themselves. And when that is done, it will be forever. And that is the fearfulness of the situation in this meeting. That is what lends to this meeting its fearful character. The danger is that there will be some here who have resisted this for four years, or perhaps who have not resisted it that long, but who will now fail to receive it as the Lord gives it and will be passed by. A decision will be made by the Lord, by ourselves, in fact, at this meeting. On which side are you going to be found? Here's another word that teaches the same point that we had last night in our lesson. To receive the word of God just as it is, just as he says it, with no question of our own. Brother Starr says that he was talking with Sister White one day about the angels at Mount Sinai at the giving of the law. And she says this. She saw the angels 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands surrounded the people of God as they assembled around the mountain. And all above them, thus making a great living tabernacle from which every evil angel was excluded, that not one word that was to come from the voice of Jesus should be altered in any mind or one suggestion of doubt or evil to a soul be made. Now, that is what we want here, congregation says, I'm in. What we want right here is for each one to just put up his own prayer himself or himself to the Lord to cover us with such a canopy as that at this institute, that when the words of the Lord are read, not one word shall be altered in any mind from just what God speaks, and that not one suggestion of doubt or evil shall come to a single soul, but that we, each one, may receive just what the Lord says in his own way, as he says it, and as he means it. Then further from Brother Star. In a late testimony to an individual here, Sister White was forbidden to send it to him in writing, but read it personally, but to read it personally, for the reason that evil angels are at work substituting words for those that are written. Other words are pronounced in his ears, and he gets a meaning just opposite from that designed of God. So, so this is Brother Starr saying about um, a testimony to an individual. So. I don't know. I haven't looked it up or anything. But maybe somebody knows more about that. <clears throat> um, so the idea that evil angels are at work substituting words for those that are written. Uh, 
I mean, we see this happening all the time, the misunderstandings that happen between brethren, words that are twisted. And sometimes, you know, this is this is the work of evil, evil angels. So it's, it's fairly interesting in that way. Um, well, he says, well, if that man needs that, is he the only one in the world that needs it? If Satan is working that way, he is, is he going to confine himself to Australia? Then don't you and I need to have our ears anointed as well as our eyes that we may hear? And does not that word of Jesus take heed now that ye hear come to us? And that's why we need to listen carefully. We need to think about the things and contemplate them. Uh, then another instance there, a brother had carried away, had been carried away by connection with secret societies and had gone through with them until he was about ready to take the highest degree. Now, we know about that story, correct, in Australia? People familiar with that story? Um, and that was... Uh, yep. uh, Masonry. You can, you can look that up and find that in uh, the Spirit of Prophecy. A testimony came for him. God presented his case to her as a man just upon the brink of a precipice to whom it was dangerous to call out even. Sister White asked the Lord what she could do for him. And as she prayed, the angel said, give him the password. Give him the password into the heavenly society, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. And what is the password into the heavenly society? Congregation, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. That is the only thing that you and I have any business to know anything about. That is his message to the world, Jesus Christ, and him crucified. That is the passport. Now turn again to Romans 4th chapter. We want to read of the righteousness of God. And while we read of this righteousness of God, we want to receive it just as the Lord has spoken it. Don't forget now. We want that canopy of angels over us and around us, that no word may be perverted to our understanding. We want to receive it just as he gave it. What shall we say then that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. What was it that was counted unto Abraham for righteousness? Congregation, he believed God. When God said a thing, Abraham believed it. He said, that is so. What was it that the Lord said to him? Let us turn and read, because that is important to us. Genesis 15, verse 4 to 6. Of course, we've spent some time looking at that chapter. And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shalt thou, this shalt, shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven and tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and it was counted, and he counted it unto him for righteousness. Now, do you believe that Abraham became righteous in just that way? Congregation, yes. Honestly, now, do you? Congregation, yes, sir. Do you know? Do you know he did? Congregation, yes. The Lord called Abraham out and said, look at the stars and tell the number of them. So shall thy seed be. Abraham said, amen. That is the Hebrew. Abraham said, amen. And the Lord said, you are right. Now, do you know that it was... A simple trans as as simple a transaction as that was it just like calling you and me out of this tabernacle and the Lord says to us see the stars tell the stars if thou be able to number them yes so shall such and such be and we say amen and he should say you are righteous suppose the Lord called out you and me to me out tonight called you and me out tonight no he can do it without calling us out he called Abraham outdoors to show him the stars, but he can show us sins without calling us outdoors. He has shown you a great many sins, has he? Congregation, yes. Now he says, if thou be able to number them, they shall be as white as snow. And what do you say? Congregation, amen. 
Then what does the Lord say? Congregation, you are righteous. Are you? Boys, yes. Do people become righteous as easy as that? Is it as simple as a transa transaction as that? Congregation, yes. Amen. Thank the Lord. Now let us turn again to the fourth of Romans and get the particular verse where this is told, Romans 4, 23 and 24. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord from the dead. Now, so this is in Romans and it's going to be referring us back to this story in in um, uh, Genesis 15. Now, we've looked at this story before, as I've said. So we're going to go there. So, I mean, this, this verse in verse 6, 15 verse 6, and he believed in the Lord, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Now, we know that in this in this story, um, that there is going to be, um, and I, I need to find the statement here because uh, it's in the spirit of prophecy. So, let's see if I can find it. Okay. So I'll find it here pretty quickly. So we know that he's going to um, ask him to cut these animals in half. Now, some people may know what I'm talking about. Why was, why was this done? Why was he told to cut these animals in half? Is that where he walked in the in this down the center of? Yeah. Uh, walked to yeah. Is okay. it a confirmation of a covenant? Okay, so there's this confirmation of a covenant, right? That that we have. Now, um, this is a statement in the spirit of prophecy. It's patriarchs and prophets. Um it's going to be this is page 137, so I'll go here. <clears throat> I'll just read it starting at 136. So in a vision of the night, the divine voice was again heard. Fear not, Abram, were the words of the prince of princes. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. But his mind was so was so oppressed by forebodings that he could not now grasp the promise with unquestioning confidence as heretofore. He prayed for some tangible evidence that it would be fulfilled. And how was the covenant prom promise to be realized? The gift of a son was withheld. What will thou give me, he said, seeing I go childless? And lo, one born in mine house is mine heir. He proposed to make his trusty servant, Eliezer, his son by adoption and the inheritor of his possessions. But he was assured that a child of his own was to be his heir. And then he was led outside his tent and told to look up to the unnumbered stars glittering in the heavens. And as he did so, the words were spoken, so shall thy seed be. Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now, this next part is rather interesting. Um, Ellen White says, still, the patriarch begged for some visible token as a confirmation of his faith and as an evidence to after generations that God's gracious purposes toward them would be accomplished. 
the Lord condescended to enter into a covenant with his servant, employing such forms as were customary among men for the ratification of a solemn engagement. By divine direction, Abraham sacrificed an heifer, a she-goat, and a ram, each three years old, dividing the bodies and laying the pieces um, a little distance apart. To these, he added a turtle dove and a young pigeon, which, however, were not divided. This being done, he reverently passed between the parts of the sacrifice, making a solemn vow to God of perpetual obedience. Now, we know there's more to this story here, but the question I ask is, how is this what he asked for? He asked for a visible token as a confir confirmation of his faith and as an evidence to after generations. Now, how is this evidence to after generations? So this happens to Abraham. He's by himself. And, and he cuts these animals half, walks through them, between them, and, and then we're going to have this burning lamp and smoking furnace pass between them. How is this a comfort? Well, it's a confirmation of his faith, but how is it evidence to after generations? I would say the evidence is in the birth of his son, Isaac, and his belief that God was going to do what he said he would do. Okay, so the thing that's going to be the evidence of after two after generations, though, is this, this making of the covenant itself. So do after generations, do they see this? Do, do they, how is it this evidence itself, this cutting these animals in half and him having this dream and, you know, him seeing this smoking, uh, burning lamp, smoking furnace. How does that become evidence? Because what is it that he's doing? What is the evidence of a sacrifice? Okay, but can can we see what happened to Abraham? Can we see this covenant? Where do we see it? You're talking about visibly seeing it with your eyes. Yeah. No, we can't see it. Well, okay, but we, we see something. I mean, I mean, we can, in a sense, visibly see it with our eyes. I mean... Because what is being represented by these animals, just on a very basic level? You cut animals in half. You set them apart, these different parts. What do we have? Are you talking about the prophetic instrument? What about a chiasm? Yeah. Okay. So this would be a chiasm, wouldn't it? And there's also going to be a prophecy given, the fourth generation, and also uh, 400 years. So we're given chronology, right? And we're given a chiasm. What's the strongest evidence that that God loves us. Isn't it a chiasm where Christ is in the center? Because these prophecies that are given here in Genesis chapter 15, do we not see them being worked out throughout history in all of these chronological structures as evidence 
of what's happened in the past. How do I know that this happened to Abraham, that this isn't just some story? What's the evidence? Isn't this prophecy? And this prophecy is being given in, in an example that is a structure that we call a chiasm. And, and what's going to happen? Is there going to be a chiasm in the story of, of any of Abraham's descendants? Where's the chiasm? Don't we see a chiasm in the life of Ishmael and also in the life of Jacob? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and in Jacob, of course, he's going to enter into Egypt 215 years after that they've been wandering in uh, Canaan, right? Right. And then 215 years after that, they're going to be delivered from Egypt, 430 years. There's two periods of 215 years. That's a chiasm. But the thing that's interesting about these chiasms, when were they first understood that, the, that these chiasms exist? Because this isn't general knowledge, right? Agreed. So which generation really needs this evidence? The fourth generation. Well, yeah, the fourth generation and our generation. Because if we're at the end of the world, to me, the strongest evidence that we're at the end of the world is that we are seeing things in God's word that have never been seen before. The chiastic structures that have been the result of understanding uh, the chronology of the Bible are miraculous. I mean, they're absolutely impossible to have been created by man. That is, they all interlock in this very complex structure. And if you were to try to create such a structure, you know, you would be very hard pressed to even conceive of such a, a such a structure. But the fact that they are confirmed by historical events is extremely powerful evidence. Now, when we deal with faith, what is faith based upon? The word of God. Okay, it's based upon the word of God. You know, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But it's based upon evidence, isn't it? We, we don't just have faith in something that has no evidence. Evidence to things not seen. Yeah, yeah. Faith is is the substance of things not. Or faith is the how's it go? Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of yeah, things. Substance not of the things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And and when we think about the substance, that's the reality. That's the tangible things. It's the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So there are things that are not seen. But there, there is an evidence. Now that evidence is connected to faith. That is, our faith is not blind faith. That is, we have a reason for our faith, do we not? Yeah. 
God gives us evidences all the time. But the thing that's given as the evidence, I mean, primarily would say that the, the cross is the strongest evidence. But at the end of the world, we have been given an understanding of chronology in these structures. And yet there are some people who still will not believe. Right? But the evidence is there. Are people going to have an excuse to reject something when they've rejected something when there is such strong evidence? I don't know where the excuse, what excuse could be. <laughs> now, if there was no evidence, wouldn't there be an excuse for rejecting something? Yeah, you'd say, well, there's no evidence. Where's the evidence? Right. But there is evidence. There is, yeah. Lots of evidence, all kinds of evidence all around us in our life, in, in the world that we see, in the scriptures. So in this faith, what, the one thing that we want to know or that we want to understand is that when he believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, that there was a reason for his faith and trust in God. And now that faith is going to be developed and tested, right? So Abraham's still going to make mistakes. Because, I mean, here he's counted as righteous in Genesis 15. Before he, he listens to his wife and tries to have uh, a son through his handmaid, right? Through, uh, through his wife's handmaid. And, and yet, you know, he's going to make these mistakes, yet he's still going to be able to offer up his son Isaac. Even though God stays his hand, he would have done so if God had not. <clears throat> so there's some very powerful things here in this story that often we miss out on. To understand what Abraham's faith is and that he's going to want this visible token. And so it's visible to us in the prophecies that have been fulfilled. So when it says now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead. So our belief needs to be in God. Some of the brethren were saying this morning in the social meeting that last night they felt as though they would like to praise the Lord out loud, but they thought they had better not quench the spirit. If you want to praise the Lord for anything, the Lord tells you to do it. We might as well start here as any other time to have Seventh-day Adventists praise the Lord or say, Praise the Lord in meeting. We might as well start that here as anywhere. What the Lord said to Abraham, Abraham believed. And what he says to you and me, you and I believe. Then we get the same results. It is not some particular thing that the Lord says that we must believe in order to be righteous. Whatever he says, believe it. And then he says, you are right. I would like to know whether it is not so that when the Lord says a thing, he is right congregation yes then when i say that it is so am i not right congregation yes what in the world hinders me from being right can you tell i will say it again when the lord says a thing is he right congregation yes he is right in saying it then when i say that is so when i say amen when i say be it so when i say yes that is so then am i not right yes am i not right just as certainly as he is Certainly. Can even he say, I am wrong? Congregation, no. He says a thing, and I say the same thing. Can he say, I am wrong? Congregation, no. When you say the same thing, can he say that you are wrong? Congregation, no. Well then, when we are in such a situation that the Lord himself cannot say that you and I are wrong, I would like to know what in the world is the reason we are not right. And believing God puts us in just that situation, as he did Abraham. I would like to know what can keep us out of heaven then. 
What can keep us out of the kingdom of God then? The only thing that can keep you and me out of the kingdom of God is to tell the Lord that he lies. And if you and I will stop that business, we will get into heaven all right. That is just what people need to do. Stop telling the Lord that he lies. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar. But whosoever, but whoever would make God a liar is a liar himself. And liars cannot get into the kingdom of God without our liars. And all those other people referred to in Revelation 21, 8, and verse 27 and 22, 15. Then the thing we want to do is stop lying. Let us quit right now. Stop lying. No difference what the Lord says. You say that is so. Don't you see this is the whole story and the very idea that Brother Haskell was trying hard to inculcate upon us here in our lessons, that there is salvation in every line of, script, of the scriptures. For God says, says it, doesn't he? Well, when God says it and we say it, then we are righteous. That is the end of it. God said that to Abraham. Abraham said, Amen. That is so. I take that. So this shows that there is salvation in every line of the scriptures and everything God says. Romans fourth chapter tells me more about what Abraham said, or rather what he thought. Romans 4, 20 to 22. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that he had promised what he had promised he was able to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, as I re read last night, without reference to the third chapter of Romans, that Christ was set forth to be a propitiation for our sin that is past, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past, through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. The thought is that God is righteous in the doing of it. This is sufficient. He has met every demand. He is perfectly able then to justify the believer in Jesus. Is he not? He is perfectly able to make the man righteous who believes in Jesus. He has promised to do that for everyone who will believe in Jesus. Well, do you believe he is able to perform what he has promised? Has he not promised to do that? Congregation, yes. Do you believe he is able to perform what he has promised? Congregation, amen. Is he? Congregation, yes, amen. Therefore, it is imputed to you for righteousness. Congregation, thank the Lord. That is all the story. Congregation, praise the Lord. The story is simple enough. The mischief of it is, though, that we allow so much of Satan's devices to get in, to mystify it. That is the mischief of, of it. He does not want that. He wants it to be just as simple as he has told it. And he has told it so simply that a little child can understand it and receive it. And you who do not receive it as a little child cannot receive it. So I say again, that it is no difference what God says, or when he says it, whatever he says, we, like Abraham, say, Amen. Lord, I believe that. That is so. Then he says, you are right, and you are right, too. <clears throat> Let us read on now in Romans 4, verse 3 to 5. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Believeth on him that justifieth who? Congregation, the ungodly. Who is it in this world that the Lord justifies? Congregation, the ungodly. The ungodly, I'm glad of it. For that assures me everlasting salvation. If it were otherwise, there would be no hope for me. If God justified people who are only half saints, that would leave me out. If he justified people who only had one good thing, that would leave me out. If he justified people who only had a little good about them, that would leave me out. But thank the Lord, he is so good. 
he loves me so much. He has such wondrous power. The divine power of his righteousness is so great that when he pronounces that word upon such a corrupt sinner as I am, it makes me through and through righteous in the sight of God. Congregation, amen. That is the worth of God's word, righteousness. And because he is so good, because there is such divine power in his righteousness, and because he justifies the ungodly, therefore, I have the perfect security of his everlasting salvation. And what in the world is going to keep me from being glad? Can you imagine anything that is going to keep me from being glad? Can you imagine anything that is going to keep you from being glad? It is not enough for me to be glad. I want you to be glad. I can attend to my part of it. The voice says, I am glad. Amen. To him that worketh not. Yes, if it required works, I could not do enough. If there was anything at all required, it would leave me out. But oh, as we read the other night, ye have sold yourself for naught, and ye are redeemed without money, but not without a price. But lo, he has paid the price, and the blessing of it is that he was rich, rich enough to pay the price, and the other blessing is he was good enough to spend all his riches in paying the price that he might have me. He can have me. I've heard brethren say, I thank the Lord I have confidence in him. I thank the Lord he has confidence in me. I think it is little enough for a, a man for whom the Lord does that much to have confidence in the Lord. But to think that the Lord would make such a wondrous investment in me with the confidence of ever getting the worth of it, his confidence in me, I cannot grasp. That is too wonderful for me. And I'm thankful that the Lord had that much confidence in his risk upon me. For that reason, I'm so glad I don't know what else to do. Brethren, the Lord is good. Congregation, amen. Then let us trust him. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man. Well, I should say so. I should say so. The blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Brethren, do you know the blessedness of that man? Or are there some in this house who know only the distressedness of that man who tries to get it by works? There is no blessedness of that kind. The Bible does not describe any blessedness of that kind. That is all distressedness only, and you know it. But God describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Oh, the blessedness of that man. That is the way David said it in his own language. But in ours, it is trans translated simply as blessed is the man. Oh, the blessedness of the man whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. There is a blessedness to that man. I tell you there is. Oh, the blessedness of the man to whom he will not impute sin, to whom the Lord will not impute sin, because that man has received the gift of Jesus Christ and all that God has given in him. And when he looks at that man, he sees Jesus Christ. He does not impute sin to that man at all. Oh, the blessedness of the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For we say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Three times you see, there inside the nine verses, three times the Lord has said it over. Faith counts for righteousness. Look at it. Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness. To him that believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. We say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. Brethren, let us do like Abraham did. Let us say, Amen. The congregation says, Amen. Counting that what God has promised, he is able to perform. Congregation says, Amen. And then thank the Lord that he imputes to us righteousness and makes us free. How was it then reckoned when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Did not he have to go and circumcise himself and all his house before he could be righteous? Congregation, no, sir. 
when he was in circumcision or in uncircumcision, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision, when he was a Gentile, is that so, congregation? Yes, sir. Before he was circumcised and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness that he had, congregation, righteousness of the faith which he had. Doesn't it say he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness which he had? Congregation, no. The seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had. Congregation, amen. A seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had, not the righteousness that he had, because the righteousness that he had had came by the faith that he had. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of faith, of the faith which he had yet been uncircumcised, that he might be a father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised. Is that you, father of all them that believe God? Congregation, amen. All them that believe, is that so? Congregation, yes, sir. That righteousness by, might be imputed unto them also. He is the father of all them that believe. What for? That righteousness might be imputed unto them also. Come along then, father of all them that believe. No wonder he could not count them. Only the mind of God could count the seed of Abraham. They are indeed numberless as the stars. But lo, of the stars it is said, he calleth them all by their names. And he is able to number us. He knows us by name. And the blessing of it is, he is going to give us a new name. I tell you, brethren, the Lord loves us. Indeed, he does. For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Is that so, congregation? Yes. For if, if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promise of none effect, because the law worketh wrath. Does it, congregation? Yes. Does it now, congregation? Yes. Then how much righteousness is any man going to get out of the law, congregation? None. That is not what the law is for. The law worketh wrath. For there, where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure. Oh, the Lord wants his promise to be sure to us, does he? And in order that it might be sure to us, where did he put it? Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure. Now look, look now, think of that carefully. I will say it slowly. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace. The word that is what I am after. What does it mean? In order that, just this way, that it might be by grace, then it is of grace, is it? Congregation, yes. It is of faith that it might be by grace. What for? That it might be sure. Then he who receives anything from God by faith, he is the man that is sure of that thing, isn't he? Congregation, yes. And he who thinks of getting anything from God in any other way than by faith never can be sure that he has it. Because, in fact, he does not have it at all. Do you see that? Congregation, yes. Let us act that way. So uh, just to deal with this point here. This idea of surety. Um, in the Bible, what is the basis of surety? Remember the story of uh, in, in Second Peter, where Peter talks about they went up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They saw Moses and Elijah with Christ. They're all glorified, transfigured. And what does Peter say?
Let's make uh, three tabernacles. Okay, so we're going to have. Um, no, but what does Peter say in his in his letter about that? So he saw this. He said, "We beheld, you know, the, in the most excellent glory, right? We saw Christ glorified." He says, "But we have what? A more sure word of prophecy. A more sure word of prophecy. So, so if we see something with our eyes." Is that more sure than prophecy or less sure? Which is more sure, seeing something with your eyes or prophecy? Prophecy. So prophecy. Why is prophecy more sure than seeing something with our eyes? Isn't, you know, seeing is believing, doesn't that... Well, we can see things and misconstrue them, but the word of God is true and sure. Okay, so we can see things, but we may not see them correctly, right? A lot of people want to go by what they see. Now, we talked about evidence, and we talked about seeing evidence, but evidence is seen through what? How do we know that something is evident? Isn't it through prophecy? Yeah. I'm not sure word, yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of things that can deceive us. <laughs> but will God's word deceive us? No. 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 Never deceive God's us. God's word will not deceive us. Prophecy will not deceive us. So we have a we more can deceive ourselves. We read that? it the wrong way. <laughs> we can okay. deceive ourselves reading it the wrong way. Okay. Now there are some verses here uh, which I want to look at. Um now the word assurance, because of course. Uh, sure and assurance are related, right? The related words. Um, um, so the words I want, the verses I want to look at, is um, in Hebrews. So there's Hebrews six eleven. So, um, for God is not, and we'll start at verse 10, and for God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, and that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Now, what does he mean by the full assurance of hope? What what is hope? Uh, Angela, what does Matthew thirteen verse fourteen to seventeen talk about? Well, I believe it's talking about opening up our spiritual eyes and ears. It says, and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of, of Isaiah, which says, By hearing you shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing you shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Yeah, and so we know that there's a type of seeing 
that really is just blindness, correct? Is that if we just see with our physical eyes, can we see eternal things? No. Right. You're so spiritually discerned. Not, spiritually right. discerned. Right. So when Moses, you know, left, uh, you know, Ur, when he when he followed God's word. He looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. If he had gone by what was seen, did he have the evidence with his physical eyes that God was leading him? Especially initially. But did, oh, he, have, yeah, yeah. did he have the full assurance of hope? Because when we think about hope, hope is kind of more like wishful thinking, isn't it? Yeah, like I uh, hope I'm going to get a job or something like yeah, that. Right. But can so when you talk about a full assurance of hope, that seems kind of presumption, doesn't it? You know, the, well, like to the point where I hope way, I'm get a not. job, in it. and if I just hope enough, you know, it will happen. So, so there's these words that are almost contradictory. Assurance and hope aren't usually in the same basket, right? Usually when we think of assurance, let's say I was going to borrow money from the bank. Um, they're not just going to hope that I pay them back, are they? What do they need? surety yeah they need they need surety they need some assurance right so there maybe i need collateral or something um so that because they're not just gonna you know hope that people pay them back so we can see how assurance and hope really don't seem to fit together but yet we have this full assurance of hope now paul's going to say later in hebrews 10 22 uh, let us draw near with a true heart in the spring uh, heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Right. Talking about our high priest, you know, on October 22nd, uh, entering in, into his work of, of you know, the, the most holy place sanctuary. But that's Hebrews 10, 22. That's why I mentioned that. Um, but here we have the full assurance of faith. Now, again, faith and hope are very similar, but hope is even weaker than faith. Right? Like I might have confidence in something. Faith in something. And that's 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 definitely different than just hoping in something. But we can have the full assurance of faith. So faith that is based upon an assurance. If I have a relationship with someone and I trust this person, do I have faith in them? Like my son, you know, he had a landscaping business and he, he had been doing it for a few years and he did um, a job for a large construction company that, he cleaned up a mess that some other landscaping business had done. So he had to go and correct everything. And um, then, you know, then, then he started bidding on jobs from this company. Well, the next year, what they did is they said, you can pick whatever jobs you want and charge us whatever you want to charge us. So why did they... Why did they do this? Did they have the full assurance of faith in my son in doing that? He yes. didn't have to bid on the jobs, right? So because they knew he was trustworthy, they wanted they wanted to, to them, it was better to have him choose the jobs and offer whatever he was willing to pay to get paid for those jobs 
than for him to be in the bidding process. And so when you have a relationship with someone and you can trust them, that's the full assurance of faith, right? So, so how is this different from the full assurance of hope? Or are they the same thing? So when you go back to Hebrews chapter six, and it talks about this uh, full assurance of hope, what is the context? If you read Hebrews chapter six, let's go on. Let's read more here. Um, for when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely, blessing, I will bless thee, and in multiplying, I will multiply thee. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. So there's this pro promise of God, right? He has to patiently endure. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel and confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, that we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us, which hope? It doesn't hope is added there, but which this hope that's set before us, which we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So the context here of this full assurance of hope is what context? Is this about the heavenly sanctuary? And, and he's going to enter into, uh, which veil is this? Anybody know in verse 19? That that takes them into the most holy. This one would be the first veil. Okay. Okay. So, so one is we know that Christ never went into the most holy place until October 22nd, 1844, right? Yes. And, and we can also look this up and we can see that this is Isaiah 22, 22. And it's also related to Revelation uh, dealing with the Church of Philadelphia. Right. So we, we've done this study before. If we go to Isaiah 22, 22, starting actually in verse uh, 21. Um, it's going to start about, uh, I will clothe thee. This is El, El, Eliakim, the son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with thy robe and strengthen him with thy girdle. I will commit thy government into his hand, and he shall be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay upon his shoulder, and he shall open, and none shall shut, and he shall shut, and none shall open. And I will fasten him as a nail or an anchor um, in a sure place, and he shall be for a glorious throne to his father's house. And so when he, uh, so this is dealing again, we'll see this context here. We're going to have this context of the door. What's the door that's open? When is there this open and shut door? Be the most holy. Yeah, this one's going to be into the most holy. The most holy, yeah. Right. Like the now, fasten, fasten him as a nail in a sure place. 
right? So this, this is an anchor, right? And, and you're going to have the key of the house of David. I will lay upon his shoulder. He shall open and none shall shut. So that's going to be the holy place, right? And then he's going to shut the door to the holy. And is anybody going to be able to shut that door once he shuts that door? Or open that door once he shuts that door? It'd be kind of hard to shut that door once you shut it. Yes, I know. <laughs> now, now in, no. yeah. So in, uh, when we do go to the Church of Philadelphia, right, it's going to quote this verse. So just get back here. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. So again, we can see that we have this in the church of Philadelphia. We're going to have this change from the holy to the most holy. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength and hast kept my word and hath not denied my name. Right. So when we look at these verses in Hebrews, what we have is uh, Christ beginning his work in the holy place. It's going to talk about the full assurance of hope in that context. And then in chapter 10, verse 22, um, it's going to be talking about the full assurance of faith in this context. Right. Correct. Yeah. Um, so we're going to have this full assurance of faith in this context. So this is showing us this, this work of Christ that begins in the holy place and then moves to the most holy place. And an assurance is found, is it found, it's found in the holy place as the full assurance of hope. And it's found in the most holy place as the full assurance of faith. Uh, I mean, this is kind of a simplification of things. But can we see that there is a difference? Because there is this, this full assurance of faith is based upon what? Or this full assurance is is based upon faith, and faith in what? When we go through the book of Hebrews, um, when he talks about the word conscience, what is he talking about? So if you look up the word conscience in the book of Hebrews. Paul, Paul uses this word throughout the book of Hebrews. So he says in chapter 9, uh, verse 8, well, let's actually go to verse 7. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood which he offered for himself and for the heirs of the people. So this is the most holy place on the Day of Atonement, right? The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the... Now, does, does this say holiest of all in the Greek? It says here that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was yet standing. Is that what it says in the Greek? Does it say holiest of all? You see there, it just says Hagion. Hagion is the holy place or the sanctuary in general. 
which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So what work could not be accomplished in the holy place? What, what did it, what happened during the holy place ministration in, in the earthly sanctuary? What would, what would you do? You'd offer your sacrifices for your sins, right? Could that make that, could that cleanse your conscience? No, no, because you no. still have a, a remember rememory remembrance my kids used to always say rememory uh you remember your sins so in order to be made perfect as pertaining to the conscience what has to happen to our sins because remember part of the word conscience here is the word science knowledge so what has to happen so that we don't have no more conscience of sins? Don't they have to be blotted out so that we cannot bring them to remembrance? Right. Yeah. Okay. So this is what he's talking about. So when he's talking about the conscience, um, he's talking about the knowledge of sin. So... It says in Hebrews uh, 9, verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place. You can see it's, again, the same Greek word, hagion, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So this is the work of the most holy place, correct? Yes. And he says in chapter 10, um, verse 1, for the law giving a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers there unto perfect. For would for then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshippers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. So he's showing that the earthly sanctu sanctuary itself couldn't actually blot out our sins. That's why we need Christ. He's going to come and blot out our sins. This is the work that has to be done, connected with the Day of Atonement. So when we get to the Day of Atonement, when Christ says, let him that is righteous be righteous still, let him is filthy be filthy still, our, are our sins going to be blotted out so that we cannot bring them to remembrance? Isn't this what Ellen White says? That the close of probation, the scapegoat is going to be bound, right? Or not bound, but he's going to be uh, tied, tied to Christ and Christ carries him into the wilderness, right? And then he's going to be bound at the end of that period. So he's going to be led away. And that happens at the close of probation, correct? Yeah. And Satan is going to struggle to get away. And if he were to get away, there would be no hope of salvation. Because that work has to be closed up. We've looked at this before when we are examining the foundation. So I hope I didn't really confuse people here. But, but you can see that when we look at these statements in Scripture, they're going to be addressing the sanctuary and so these these ideas about assurance these ideas about um the conscience 
these are questions that are addressed in the sanctuary. And that's where we see these statements, the full assurance of faith and the full assurance of hope. And we just often don't examine what's being said there. Okay, so let's go back to Jones. Therefore, it is a faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all. Good, congregation, amen. To all, to all. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that which also is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written. I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him, whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. What does he do? Congregation quickeneth. What does he do? Congregation makes alive. Giveth life unto the dead. Calling those things that be not as though they were. When he calls the thing that is not as though it were, then is it? Congregation, yes. Did not he do that which that when he made the worlds? There were no worlds. He called them, and what then? Congregation, they were. There was no light. He called the light. There was light. In me is no righteousness. Here is all ungodliness. Here is all uncleanness. God has set forth that same one who declared the word. And the worlds came and who declared the word light and light came. He has set forth that same one to declare righteousness in place of this body of sin. Congregation, praise the Lord. In this place, this body, this character of sin, he calls that which is not as though it were. And thank the Lord it is. Congregation, amen. In this place, which, in, which is all uncleanness, he has set forth that blessed one to declare holiness. And he calls this thing which is not as though it were. And thanks be to his almighty power. It is. Congregation, amen. And I'm glad of it. Calleth those things which be not as though they were. A sinner is not righteous. The ungodly are ungodly. But God calls them that which is not as though it were. And it is. Congregation, amen. It is. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations? According to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And be not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also to whom it shall be imputed. If we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. He was raised that we might be justified, raised for our justification. I'm going to let him accomplish what he has, what he was raised from the dead for. That is settled. He knows how to do it and he can do it. And I'm going to let him. Now, the fifth chapter of Romans. Therefore, being justified by faith, what do you say, congregation? Amen. Therefore, being made righteous, being justified by faith, we have peace with God. And I know it, don't you? We have peace with God. He says so, then it is so. Even though it were not so, then it is so. Even though it were not so, it is so, after he calls those things that be not as though they were. We cannot understand it, but we can know it. I know it, and that is all I care to do. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into his gra this grace. How did we get into this grace? By faith. We have it, thank the Lord, wherein we stand. Do we stand there indeed? Congregation, yes. 
He says so. It is so, isn't it? He says so, and it is so. He says we stand there, and we do, thank the Lord. Wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, don't we? He says we rejoice, and we do. But because when he says we do, he is right, and we say amen, and then we are right. And not only so, but the glory of tribulations also. Tribulations will come along as easy as can be, but they will not amount to anything against us. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed, not to us only, but in us, which shall be a part of us. And that is how we shall shine as the light, as the sun, shine as the sun in the kingdom of, of the Father. Well, that is the righteousness of God. That is how Abraham received it. What is the blessing of Abraham then? What is it? Congregation, righteousness by faith. And how did he get it? Congregation, by faith. The blessing of Abraham is not received except by that man who has righteousness by faith. Is that so? Congregation, yes, sir. Now, the text that Brother Prescott just read, I do not care if he did read it. It comes into my lesson as well as his. And it is all one lesson anyway. Galatians 3, verse 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. Has he? He says he has, and then he has. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. The blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus Christ, or why did Christ become a curse on the tree? That the blessing of Abraham might come on you and me. Why did he redeem us from the curse of the law, that the blessing of Abraham might come on you and me? What is the blessing of Abraham? Congregation, righteousness by faith. Christ died that you and I <coughs> might be made righteous by faith. <coughs> Excuse me. Brethren, isn't it awful when a man will rob Christ of the very thing for which he died and want righteousness in some other way? Isn't it awful? Brethren, let us believe in Jesus Christ. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. Now then, we are redeemed from the curse of the law. Christ is made a curse for us, that the blessing of Abraham might come upon us. <coughs> and what does that come upon us for? That we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Then when we as a people, we as a body, we as a church... Have received the blessing of Abraham. What then? Congregation, the latter rain. The outpouring of the Spirit. It is so with the individual. When the individual believes in Jesus Christ and obtains the righteousness which is by faith, then the Holy Spirit, which is the circumcision of the heart, is received by him. And when the whole people as a church receive the righteousness of faith, the blessing of Abraham, then what is to hinder the church from receiving the Spirit of God? Congregation, nothing. And that is where we are. What is to hinder then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? What holds back the outpouring of the Holy Ghost? Voice, unbelief. Our lack of the righteousness of God, which is by faith, that is what holds it back. For when that is received, it is given in order that we may receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Then let us be sure we have the blessing of Abraham and then ask and we shall receive so when we when we go back and look at what jones how he started this series he starts with this statement about the need of the holy spirit and you know often there's this misunderstanding about what receiving the holy spirit means we're highly influenced by um the religious environment in which we live now um we talked about this before the coming of the comforter the book by um uh, Froom, where he basically presents a completely non-Adventist view of what the Holy Spirit is. And that view has existed within the church. That is, people look at the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as something magical, right? Something that's just done to us sort of without our will. It's God is going to arbitrarily just pour out the Holy Spirit. There's all kinds of Christians wanting the Holy Spirit, 
but God's withholding the Holy Spirit until some such a time that he decides to to pour it out. Correct? Isn't that thinking common? Extremely. Yeah. It's been, been ever since I've been going. Directly. Yeah. Okay. So we know that the Holy Spirit is a message, right? The latter rain is a message. And that message has been given to the Adventist church already. So is God withholding his spirit? Not at all. Not at all, right? God wants to pour that spirit out, but he can't because we are hindering him. And how do we hinder him? How do the Jews hinder him? Unbelief. Believe, right? We don't believe God's word. We as a church. What's that? We as a people will not make ourselves ready. Right. And even individually. Right? We don't believe God. Now, it's one thing to say, I believe God. It's another thing to actually believe God. Right? Saying that you believe God doesn't mean you do. And, and see, people take this, and, and they can take Jones wrong, because Jones doesn't mean it in this way. Because he means it in reality. We actually believe God, not that we just say we believe God. He understands that belief has to be real. It can't be uh, pretend. It can't be uh, just something we put on. But we need to be able to receive the message. And receiving a message means to hear it and obey it. But the thing is, can we believe God? God is giving us so much evidence of what he wants to do. And yet we don't believe him. And we don't believe him because we make a prediction, July 18, 2020, and it doesn't happen as we predicted. Did we believe God before if we didn't believe him after? If we, if we didn't believe God after July 18th, did we believe him before July 18th? No. No, we didn't, did we? Because if, if we believed God, would we be... Would we just... We'll be, we'll be because it's against a belief it. in God, not a belief in us, right? Okay, Jeff, you have a comment? If we believe God, we wouldn't be fighting against it, you know. Right, we would still have accepted it afterwards. And and we would actually even see it more clearly, right? Yeah, yep. Right? Which which I believe that we are. We're seeing much more clearly I why God... I see it more clearly than I used to. Yeah. Clear. And so we know that we believe God because we believe him, right? We can see things correctly. We have this full assurance of faith based upon our experience, based upon these objective evidences that go because we see things spiritually. So people think, if I saw it happen July 18, 2020, and Nashville was hit. Now, those people who didn't believe God before, right, because they didn't believe him after, if it had occurred, would they still? Would they believe him? Because they didn't believe him before, really. Because we know that now, because they didn't believe him after. But if it had happened, would they then have believed? No. No, they wouldn't have, right? And why not? It's more grounded. More very grounded. Well, well, they wouldn't have believed him. If it had happened, they wouldn't have believed him. What would they have had? Righteousness by what? By works. Well, okay, but righteousness by sight. Yeah, right. Right? That's the seeing is believing idea. But we know that we perceive things spiritually. And, and that something that's perceived spiritually is much more real than something that's perceived 
naturally. Not by sight, by faith. Right? Because the spiritual insight that Peter, James, and John had when they saw Christ transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, what they saw, they were seen with their, their human eyes. They didn't, they didn't really understand what they were seeing. Peter wanted to make three tents. Right. But once they understood, once they understood the more sure word of prophecy, they were able to see things spiritually. And that's the type of sight that we need. Now, to some people, that's rather abstract. To see things spiritually isn't something that you can just put on. It comes from light shining at you from God's word, shining upon your sins. You respond to that light. You obey the voice of God. And you walk in the light that God has given. And you see things in that light. Not with your human sight, but with the eye of faith. And that is more real than human sight. But it's still based upon reality. Because some people think, well, I could just make up any Bible chronology that I want, and it doesn't have to agree with, you know, ancient documents or reality in any sense. I can make up some pattern of jubilees or, or something and just fit the Bible story in my imagination of how I think chronology, chronology should work. But could we have manufactured, if we had done that, could we have manufactured something so powerful as the lines that we have? What Stephen has laid out in those in those charts, could we even have conceived or imagined of something on this nature? No, because I've seen where man has has fit the Bible to his imagination about how chronology should look, and there's no power in that. But when I find Prophecy matches reality. I still need the spiritual eyesight to perceive it. Because without spiritual eyesight, if I draw these lines on the board and I show all of these spans of time, is that going to convince anybody? Is anybody without spiritual eyesight going to be able to see it? No. No, they won't, they won't see what's in the lines. So only through the Holy Spirit can we understand God's word. And when we follow the principles, precept upon precept, line upon line, here little, there little, we know that we can now see something because God is asking us to see something spiritually. But even if you draw those lines in front of a person, they're not going to see it unless they have the Holy Spirit. And they have the Holy Spirit because light has come to them and they have accepted that light showing them their sins and they forsake their sins so somebody who's holding on to his sins who's avoiding the light won't see light when it's shining on them will they because they want to be in the darkness and you can't force them to see the light <clears throat> So we need to understand what this faith is. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay. Let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we are very, very grateful uh, for this past um, week and for the Sabbath the hours that we are in as we have opened up your word and your Holy Spirit has spoken to us. We ask, Lord, that we can see spiritual things. We ask, Lord, that we can see our sins and our need of you. That, that in spite of that, too, we can trust that you are making us righteous, that you are transforming our characters, that you have declared us righteous in spite of what we see, that we can be made righteous in Christ. Help us to trust in this work that you are doing. In spite of what we see in our lives, help us to cling to you each moment to know that we will see ourselves as sinners and yet trust that you are uh, cleansing us 
from sin. Be with each person and be with those watching these videos. May your angels protect the words that have been spoken from your word, that they can clearly be seen and understood. We pray and thank you for all things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.